they refuse him? Step behind Some people him. don't like to be touched. Step behind him. I'm My grandma, I'm a, I'm a, he doesn't want assistance, but he needs it. I'm, I'm gonna stay close enough. I'm yeah. gonna stay close enough. I'm gonna stay close enough. I'm not. But if I'm really, if I'm really worried about somebody, I'm not gonna let anybody walk on me that I'm really worried about falling like that. Now, sir, I'm sorry, but uh, it's no. hospital policy. I can't let you walk because when you when you're an inpatient or ER patient, they don't have. They shouldn't be walking. You know, if they come in a stretcher, you should keep them in that stretcher. But you will see some people at the hospital. They're gonna get the person out of the stretcher and have them walk to the room all the time. Nothing's wrong with that if they can do it. But at the same time, you're just taking a risk by doing that because that patient may fall. Like I tell you, that's one of the worst things that can happen to patient fall. And I would, I would never want that. I like the distance he's maintaining right here. Yeah, let him do his own thing. I might just have a, a hand on you. I even tell people to use the rails on the wall so they can help get to, get to the room. I tell them to use the rails on the wall for help. Okay. In this case right here, guys, you, you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to transfer a patient from this wheelchair to the bed. You need two people just like that. One, see how he got his, his hands up under the arms? Need somebody to do that because the, the top part is usually like the heaviest part. The legs are usually light depending on the, on most people. But lifting up the torso and everything, that's the, so you want the strong person to be on the, on, the, on, the, on the torso. You want the, I guess, the weaker person to be on the legs. Okay? But you got to move in unison. So you're gonna basically count to three and lift up transfer that patient over to the bed like that, okay? So you're gonna, you got, and especially being students, <laughs> I hate to say it, but they're gonna be using y'all for stuff like that, guys. They gonna be using y'all for transportation, filling up my room with linen, you know, filling up my jail bottle, going to get my patient, scanning scanning those documents that we I showed you yesterday, that I gave you yesterday. Mm -hmm. You're gonna feel used at some point, but you build that trust. Gain that trust with your technology. Right, Pat? Because then they'll let you, then they, when, they, when they trust you, you're going to be running their room for them. They might say, here, Lauren, go and start this exam for me. I'll be back in 30 minutes. I'm going to eat breakfast. And that's your opportunity. That's a comp right there. That's your opportunity to get a competency right there because that room is yours. Don't, no, no. And please don't refuse exams if, if a tech asks you to do that. Even if you don't know how to do it, unless it's like a doctor that you just don't know how to do anything, if it's a pelvis or an abdomen, get down there and try just try because if you tell them no one time, they may not ask you again. Okay. And don't so, say I don't know. Just do it. Just do it. Just give it a shot. <laughs> just get, especially if you're dealing with James at LBJ, because mm -hmm. he'll just go to the next student, and then next thing you know, that'll be his go-to student every time. And then you'll be mad at Uber because why well, Uber getting all the special treatment? That's just how it works. That's just how it works sometimes. I can't go to James' job and tell him, hey. You need to treat all the students, let all the students do this, this. That's his department. I can't tell him how to run his department, right? Because when you're in his department and you're working, you work for him. You know, you're still a member of the school, but you work for him. Because, you know, that he's going to put you where he needs you to be. Okay? So transferring and transporting patients. Guys, <laughs> notice how I scratched out, do not. Because that's, that's, to me, that's not true. We always transport and transfer patients, guys. So I would say sonographers typically move patients from gurneys or stretchers, but they should be aware of how patients are transferred. Guys, I have to transfer patients all the time. Pat, we have to transfer patients all the time here at Harris Hill. So I don't know why it says we typically do not. I know like at Methodist, they have a transporter just for radiology. They'll come, all I, <laughs> I miss it so much because you're so spoiled over there. You go, you, you go in your room, transport to bring the patient in, get the patient on the bed for you. I, I do my exam, I need a patient right there, transport it, come back, and get the patient, take them out. I love it, I missed it. Yeah, I missed that, that was, I was four back then. Do they have transportation Not in the room, not, not just for radiology. Oh, they they do have transportation, that yeah, that'll bring them to the department. Yeah. But I mean, they'll bring them in the room for you. All you do is scan at Methodist, that's it. That's it, all we do is scan and then we get out of there. I saw it also too, and nobody in the hospital. One time I had the other time, I was in some I saw there was somebody rolling. Yeah, rolling. Yeah, it's nice. It's yeah, nice. This is better. Methodist is a good. I like working there. I used to have fun there. Okay. Sonographers may be involved in transporting patients to the sonography department. Give you guys an example. Sometimes on a busy day, I know I get off at 11 p. 11:30 p.m. Man, they ordered a patient at 11. It used to be my. I used to be my responsibility to. If they ordered before I got off, I had to do it. 
So sometimes I'll be at work till one in the morning because they'll order something at 11.30. So let's say they order something at 11. I put the request in for transportation. It may take 15 minutes for that, for them, for that patient to come from the emergency room all the way to ultrasound. So I'm bypassing all that. I'm running down to the emergency room. I'm going to get the patient myself, right? Because I don't want to waste time. I'm trying to get off on time. I got stuff to do tonight. I gotta hit the reverse happy hour or something like that. Right? <laughs> so I'm trying to leave at eleven thirty. So I'm going to get my patient, you know. But before you go and get a patient, you gotta talk to the nurse. Let the nurse know, hey, I'm coming to get this patient to take him to ultrasound. You know, how are they traveling? Yo, they need a wheelchair. I may have to go around the corner and get a wheelchair. Or me personally, I may just take them in a the stretcher. I'll just take them in a stretcher, move the stretcher in the hospital with him, get them over there, do my exam, done by eleven thirty. Said I get transportation to take them back though. I ain't doing that work. <laughs> I get them to take them back though. So we always have to transport patients, whether it be from the waiting room to the ultrasound room. You have to do it that way too. So because a lot of times we have a holding area, and you guys have to go get the patient out of the holding area. You have to transport and wheelchair and stretcher and get that patient to your room so you can do the exam. Okay. So again, like I just said, I inform the patient's nurse that I'm going to be transporting the patient. I asked the nurse if there are any special transport needs. Wheelchair, you know, um, do they have an IV pole with them? Do they have a Foley catheter? You know, any kind of special needs uh, concerning that patient. Evaluate the patient's abil ability to ambulate. Again, guys, ambulate means to walk, being able to walk, okay? Always ask for help if needed, if any part of the transport. Always ask for help, guys. Again, don't ever, 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 if I had a 500 pound person, I'm not gonna try to transport this patient by myself. Be in the hallway, ugh, giving everything I got. <laughs> the other side of the apartment may be on the second floor or something. You don't ever know. It may be on the other side of the hospital, right? Because a lot of times the ultrasound, the radiology is next to emergency, but it's not always that close. You know, it may be a little while. So, you know, definitely get help if you need it. If the chart is accessible, guys, you know, remember, a lot of places you go to, they may, they may not have the binder chart or the paper charts anymore. Remember when I logged on Epic yesterday? Mm -hmm. Those are our electronic charts right there. Mm -hmm. So um, if the chart is accessible, obtain the chart if, if they're going somewhere else. Also, guys, when, you're, uh, when you happen to go and get a patient, check the information on Epic or the chart because that patient may be a contact patient. You know, that's why you got to talk to the nurse. You know, you don't, don't just go in a room and just be in a hurry and just take the patient without somebody knowing. Okay, get with the nurse because that patient may be contact, isolation, droplet infection, you know, or both, or both. So you don't want to be doing a patient and then tomorrow you find out, oh, that person had TB. You know, now I got to go through all the TB protocols to make sure I don't have it, you know? So definitely take care of yourself. That's the number one thing. Take care of yourself. Okay, take care of yourself. Hold on for this case about the TB case. Even when we're, okay, if let's say we don't know if, how we gonna tell if the patient has any kind of? If you can go to the chart, or if they have a, yes, if they have a, if they have a chart, uh -huh. it'll say it on there. If, if it have, they have epic, it'll flash on there. One of the first things, like if they have like contact isolation for like C diff or something like that, mm -hmm. or MRSA, you're gonna know that before. It's gonna that's the first thing you're gonna see when you open up their patient name on the chart. Okay? You're gonna know that. They have a special procedure to do it, like. You gotta get a gown. Uh -huh. You gotta get gowned up, masked up. You know, maybe have to wear the hair net. You know, because you don't want to take that stuff home. With you. you get C diff, you might be out of out of work for about two weeks. You might be out of work for two weeks with uncontrollable bowels. So definitely, you want to. You don't want to take that to the house. Next thing you know, at a whole house, for everybody, you know, got C diff. Of course, we don't talk about that in our medical emergency. Okay, establish the correct identity of the patient, guys. Always check the patient's armband. Uh, and, yeah, if they don't have an arm, especially with an inpatient or an ER patient, if they don't have an armband, I'm not taking that patient at all. I'm not even going to do this exam until that patient has an armband on their arm. I don't care if it's on their bed. That may or may not be that patient. I need somebody to put that armband on that patient's arm. Okay? Same thing with babies because babies, a lot of times, infants, they don't have their armband on. They'll have it in the, in the you know, so I need somebody, especially what if it's a twin? What if I'm, I need twin A, but I'm over here, twin B and twin A are right next to each other, and I need somebody to come identify them, right? So always, always, always check those armbands and check that medical record number to make sure that's the right person because 
twin A have a different medical record number than twin B. Okay. Okay. Transfer the patient to the sonography department and relate any unique patient needs to those responsible for his or her care. So let's say, again, I finished my exam, I'm done right before 11.30. And mind you, when it's 11.30 at night, a lot of times you're the only person in the department. You know, the department is closed. The, the lights in the hospital get dim and everything. So I'm not even gonna take that patient to the waiting room or the holding area, and then I'm just gonna leave and just, I'm going to the house now. I'm gonna make sure that patient has transportation to go back. I'm not even gonna leave that. That happened before where a patient was over in the, in the holding area till the next morning. Man, this person got wrote up for leaving that person because you were in a rush to get out, but then you were in a rush to get suspended now because now you can't come to work for a couple of days. You know, so definitely make sure your patients get to where they need to get because ultimately you're responsible. You know, if that patient don't get back to the nurse, I'm calling the nurse, hey nurse, your patient on the way back. You know, I'm all about that communication because I'm telling you, stuff will come back to you. Stuff will come back to you. You're the last person that's coming to you. Got it. I don't have much left. We just talking about circumstances requiring unique assistance now. So care for patients with a intra IV infusion. Remember I was talking about that um, yesterday. You never go how, how you gonna go to a patient. They may have ten machines hooked up to them, you know, when they come down to you. You have to know how to take care of a patient with a IV infusion, especially. That's that little machine right there that's on the IV pole right here. Got it. Jasmine, <laughs> remember we were talking about yesterday, if it start beeping, first thing I'm gonna check to see if the line is straight. I wanna make sure the patient, the patient isn't, their arm isn't bent and that line is straight. Because I can just come up here and press that orange button. That's silence. I don't mm -hmm. care. Let me get my exam done, get this patient back. Don't do that. Don't do that unless you check everything to know like, cause I'm not about to, go in here and take out the line and adjust it. I'm not messing with that. But at the same time, I can't ignore if it's, if it's chiming at me, if it chimes at me, okay? So a patient may require a simple IV infusion with an IV bag, or they may have an IV infusion pump. They may travel, they may be ambulatory walking with the IV pump, okay? Um, an IV bag must continually be located higher than the infusion site. Always, guys. So, if you see somebody traveling with the with the IV pump on the bed with them, it should never be in the bed with them. It should never be below them because the IV pump infusion pump works by gravity, mm -hmm. right? Because if you if you don't have it above them, then this their uh, their line can get backed up, and then you will see it'll be, it'll be it'll be blood in it. You know, it may get some induration, maybe swelling, pain. You know, so you definitely don't want to get to that point because then in that case. It come back to you. I'm telling you guys, they'll put, they're gonna, they gonna blame it on you, okay? If that's not maintained, there may be retrograde filling of blood into the tumor. So if a patient comes to me like that, guys, I'm sending that patient right back. I'm not even gonna start this exam. I, I tell my boss, hey, I sent that patient back. They had blood in, in the in the line. It's all backed up. The patient's in pain. I don't even wanna, I'll let, them, let them go get that fixed first and then they'll come back, okay? So. Never place the bag in the patient's lap. You see that all the time where patients in a wheelchair, the wheelchair may not have the IV pump on it. You just gotta hold it, wheel with one hand. You know, but don't put it on their lap because it's gonna, they're gonna get that retrograde feeling. We, retrograde is, is like going backwards, right? That's what retrograde means. It's kind of like um, reverse. reverse flow, kind of like what? Oh, kind of like oh, our fugal, oh, our no. fugal flow, right? Oh, fugal, going from, going away, oh. right? That's what I'm trying. That's the word I was looking for, right there. Guys. Okay. So with electronic infusion, sonographer should not adjust the flow rate. Remember, I said I'm not gonna go in there and adjust these these numbers they got right here on this device. Yeah. Go in there. <laughs> I may go in there, but I, I will do this though. Other than pressing silent, I'll press this button right here, that restart button. Restart once I once I make sure their arm is straight. Now I'll hit it again, restart to get a fresh start. That may or may not fix it. It still may chime on, right? But once I've checked checked everything, say for instance, man, I'm really worried. I don't know what's going on. I can't figure it out. Figure it out. You know, I'll go and call a nurse. Hey, can I can I cut the uh, close all the lines up? And I'll just close everything off until that patient gets back upstairs. Um, 
Okay, also guys, when they're traveling with those, these are electronic devices, so they have a battery. So definitely plug that into the wall when you bring the patient in. Okay. Don't ever do, even if it's a quick exam, still plug it in because you don't know how much juice is on those. So plug it in for that patient so it doesn't cut, cut off on them. Yes. So is this something that will run as we're working or is that going to get a specific training? Mm -hmm. You kind of learn it as you're working. Mm -hmm. You learn it as you're working. That's why I'm giving you the heads up right now. You're learning it right now. Yeah. You're going to apply it next month. <laughs> Alarm signals may give an alert that something is wrong with IV administration. Guys, listen for that, those sounds. I'm telling you, they're annoying. You don't like unless you work in the ICU. That's the only time you're gonna be used to those sounds. So they, you, it's gonna be annoying. All right. So continue on that. Take care not to dislodge the eye. Man, you know, be careful with those catheters. You know, don't be. Snatch, don't be, don't come to the patient, they covered up, and you snatch the covers off of them, you know, because you mess around and snatch the IV out of their hand. Because a lot of times, depending on that person, they may be a frequent flyer at the hospital, and they be, may have the IV in the finger, you know, because they already exhausted all of the possibilities. You snatch it out, it was already took 30 minutes to stick. You get in trouble for that, so be careful. When you when you dealing with the IVs because so you, you need, know you, need the you can you can pull it out and then I'm sending that patient back. If the patient complains of pain, discomfort, burning, or swelling, he may be having complications with the IV such as IV infiltration. Infiltration meaning that it's no longer in the vessel and now it's going into the tissues. See right here, that's going to cause that swelling all the way around that IV right there. Or phlebitis. Alert the patient's nurse as soon as possible. Got it. I might even take that patient back up to the nurse myself if that happened to me. I know when you a cast when you in cast scan, you deal with that a lot, right, Pat? Mm -hmm. If you don't, if if you have the the contrast going into the patient too fast, you you can you can burst the blood vessel, right? Can't you burst the blood vessel, and then you have all of that infiltration in the skin. So just be careful with those with these um these IVs, guys. Here's an example right here. This is how they come. See, it's above the patient, guys. The IV has to be above the patient. Just like this one, right here. This is exactly how you're going to see it. IV above the patient. And that's, an, that's an example of the machine here at, at, at Harris Hill. Right there. Okay, again, that orange button is silence, but don't just silence, silence the machine until you know what's going on with the patient. Okay. So let's talk about um, catheters. Patient coming to you with a catheter. So again, IV pumps above the site, a bladder bag, a catheter, or uh, the bag for the urine no, below the bladder, okay? Mm -hmm. has to be below the bladder. Remember, we're talking about gravity here. So the, it has to be below the bladder, so when it comes out, it's not going back into your body, creating a um, UTI, you know? Because that's one of the most common nosocomial or hospital-acquired infections is a UTI, mm -hmm. okay? And that happens when the bag is not below the patient, okay? Again, don't put this bag in the patient's lap Right? Mm -hmm. Don't carry the bag while you're wheeling. Hang that bag on the side of the wheelchair, on the side of the stretcher, like this right here. All stretchers, even the stretchers in here, have that little rail. They have a little plastic clip that hangs on to the side right there. Okay? Make sure that tubing is straight. Don't have that, that tubing coiled up or kinked up either. So if you see it like that, go ahead and unkink un it or uncoil it. All right? So, of course, so knockers do not, I, can, I kept that do not, we do not typically insert catheters, Ooh, thank goodness, right? But they do perform sonograms on people with them, okay? Urinary catheter bags should always be placed lower than the bladder to avoid introducing bacteria from the drainage system into the bladder. That's, that's what we, that's again, that retrograde kind of flow right there, okay? Learn your institution's policies and procedures regarding needing a full bladder when performing ultrasound exams. God, what's the one exam we need a full bladder for? Anybody know? What's the one exam we need a full bladder for? We transabdominal. Transabdominal pelvis. That's the only because we need that bladder as a window to see the the um the uterus and the ovaries. Okay, so that's the one exam. The transabdominal pelvis. The transvaginal pelvis. We need in the empty that bladder, right? Okay. So guys, this is an example right here. Guys, always try to place it right here, even if they are on your stretcher in the room. Place that bag right there. It may be on your side. I'm not, I, I'll tell you the truth. Sometimes, depending on how big that bag is, 
you may have to empty that bag too because it'll be that full sometimes. And you may have to open up the thing and empty it into like a urinal, empty it into, you know, the toilet. So don't think that that's off limits. You, you probably will be responsible for that at some point. Otherwise, I've seen that bag bust and go all over the floor and then your room is down for 20 minutes because somebody has to come in there and mop it up and clean it up. So definitely, if you see it too full, go ahead and empty it. Go ahead and empty it, all right? If you don't know how to empty it, get somebody who does. Also, you'll see guys come in here like this, you know, with the, with the bag attached to their leg. So if it's attached to their leg and you can have a little clip, go ahead and unattach it to their leg because you can't lay down again. That bag is on the same level as the bladder. You gotta put it below there. So take this bag and let it hang out the side. Let it hang out the side of the bed or the end of the bed because you, you're gonna contribute to that, that flow going backwards, okay? So this right here, guys, usually the people come in, they have a Foley catheter. A Foley catheter is a catheter that uses a balloon that's inflated with saline while it's in the bladder. Okay. You can see that on ultrasound when you're looking at the bladder image. Because every time you do a renal exam, every time you do kidneys, you have to do a bladder. Okay. So this is what a Foley catheter looks like right here. This is the part usually outside of the patient right here, going into the bag. This is the part, this is the balloon right here that's inside of the uh, inside of the patient, and that's the tip right there. So how does it look on ultrasound? You may ask Ann. Right. That's how it looks on ultrasound right there. You can see the ring. This ring right here, that's the balloon right there. Inside of there, can y'all see that echogenic inside of there? Right here, you can see it. That's the, that's the actual catheter right there. This is what the catheter looks like inside of the bladder via ultrasound, okay? So don't be alarmed when you see it when somebody's doing a bladder. That's why I put this in this PowerPoint so you guys will know what it looks like. It looks like a perf perfect ring, a perfect ring. It looks just like that. Transverse image right here, transverse image. Transverse and long image right here. In long image, you'll be able to see it, the, the, the catheter going through the balloon. The round part is the balloon inflated right there. That's a Foley catheter, guys, a Foley catheter, okay? So, last thing, uh, well, two more things. Uh, Care for a patient in the oxygen, with an oxygen tank. So, if a patient comes to us with, a, with an oxygen, a lot of times they're gonna come like this. This is the oxygen tank right here. They're usually gonna be rolling. Guys, this oxygen tank is not light. The oxygen tank probably weighs about 15 to 20 pounds. Okay, so, and then depending on how much oxygen is in it, it could be heavier, all right? So this, these, these tanks are really, really heavy. So if a patient come to you with a tank like this, this is when our outpatient come to us to see us with a, with a tank, we're not just gonna let that man run out of oxygen when we bring him into the room. We're gonna hook, we're gonna detach his, his line from, from here, and we're gonna hook it up to the wall right here. See our little cannula, cannula thing right here? Mm -hmm. That's the tube right there. We're just gonna take it off of, of, of here. But first, we have to observe the amount of um, liters per minute that the doctor put it on. Guys, when somebody uses oxygen, that's medicine. That's a prescription. Mm -hmm. So if somebody just comes in the room and just says, hey, you got any oxygen? You can't give that person oxygen. Don't let them sucker you or con you into giving them. If they didn't come with oxygen, I'm not giving you oxygen. You got it? So always, before, before I take it off of their device and put it to the wall, always look at how many liters per minute that, the, that it's set to. So if it's set to three, set the wall to three, okay? And you do that by turning this green dial right here. You turn it um, counterclockwise and it should uh, open up the line for the air, for the oxygen, okay? Oh, and lastly, take care of when working with oxygen because of its combustibility potential. So be careful, like I said, that's why these things are so heavy because people, if you drop it, you know, it probably, it, chances are it'll still be fine. So be careful not to drop those because, um, for example, I remember an MRI, one of those things, because these are non-ferromagnetic, it got sucked into the MRI machine mm -hmm. from, the, from the magnet and it killed the person. Wow. Mm -hmm. Dr. Black loves telling this story for some reason. But yeah, so when you guys go to MRI, be careful with your metals and stuff like that. That's what I'm trying to say. But they'll let you know. So don't, don't you probably don't take your credit card in there or anything like that because it may get zapped. And it may, may erase all your information. Okay. So 
I know it have a lot of different, you know, uh, masks or cannulas, how, it, how they may come with the tank. So it may come a nasal cannula, nasal catheter, or the face mask. Guys, a lot of times, you go, we go to the patient that have face masks, like if they're getting a breathing treatment or something like that, we'll go see them. Most of the time we see patients like this with the nasal cannula. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you may have to put it back on the patient, put it on the patient, put it in their nostrils. Remember, it goes in the nostrils like this. Don't, don't, don't have it the opposite way in the nose, okay? Put it in there so it goes in like this, and then it has a little, a little tie. You just zip it up to the chin right here so it can stay right there. It goes around the ear and it ties up right here. That, that nasal canyon. That's what see it tight, it's tied right there, right under the chin. Make sure you guys uh that nasal cannula is, is on, okay? Don't give them more oxygen than what, what was prescribed to them, okay? If the doctor prescribed them the three um, liters per minute, you put your wall on three liters per minute. Okay? Because they're gonna, again, they're gonna curse you. Go and give me a little bit more. Go and give me a little bit, go and put it on 10. No, I can't do that. The doctor got you on three liters per minute, okay? So do know the range of prescription can be between one and 15 liters per minute. Is oxygen green? Yeah, oh, in the hospital? Yeah, it's gonna be late. I'm, I got a picture right there showing you that's how the wall looks when you're in the hospital. It's usually like on the, on the side of your wall, next to your stretcher, behind the bed if you're in a patient's room. So they have, of course, the green one right here, both of these are probably oxygen right here as I'm looking at them. The, this is the um, the suction right here. If you have a patient that needs suction right there, and that's the suction machine device right there to cut that suction on right there. Okay, so that's how that wall will look in the patient room when you see them. All right. Okay. And I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Is anybody there in the hospital to uh, train us on this machines or? The technologists will, because. Nine times out of 10, all you're gonna be doing is oxygen anyway. So yeah, somebody will show you how to use it. So last thing guys would be assisting patients with a bedpan, urinal, and emesis basin. I added the emesis basin because you know, you see those all the time. So this right here guys, that's a bedpan. We are familiar with those, right? We're not exempt from them. You may have to, somebody may come to you and be like, oh, I gotta go to the restroom. You gotta go and know where your supplies are. That's my that's my biggest thing because I always see people running around the hospital looking for these three items. Know where your supplies are. Okay, we want we want to get that orientation when we go to the hospital. But know where your emesis basin is. Know where your uh, emesis bag is. If they they have them hanging on the wall, emesis so people can throw up in there. This is our emesis tray right here. Our emesis basin. People can 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 throw. I don't know the proper what's the proper term for throwing them. Vomit. Vomit. I don't like that word, it's, that's ugly. <laughs> up chuck, I like that, I like that. Anyway, so we can throw up in this emesis basin right here. So if you see, hear people asking for the emesis basin, that's what they're looking for right there. A lot of times this is in every single ultrasound room in the cabinet, okay? All three of these items. So you may have to put this under the patient, guys. You get your glove. I always wear gloves when you're dealing with something like anything. I don't care, you're dealing with the urinal bag or Anything I'm dealing, I'm touching the machine. I don't know where that machine came from. I'm always gonna wear my glove, Samin. Mm -hmm. I always have your gloves <laughs> on, all right? So you may have to put that under the patient. Me as a guy, probably step out of the room, let the person use the restroom, come back. Then I gotta have to empty that out into the toilet. So again, don't be surprised if you have to do these things. Don't be surprised if you have to put the, um, the bedpan under the patient, okay? This right here is a urinal. Of course, guys use urinals, usually for people that can't get up and go to the restroom, of course, right? So that's how you will see people use it. I'll step out while that person uses the restroom, you know? Sometimes you may have to help. You may have to help somebody use the urinal, especially if they can't get their situation inside of the urinal. You may have to help them and hold it for them. Don't be, don't be freaked out that you may have to, I've been- Why don't you go to the restroom? Cause they can't walk. They can't walk. They can't walk. So that's why they have to go. I had to help. So you know, um, you gotta swallow your pride in them, in them times. You know, I don't wanna. You know, I don't wanna have to do that. But you know, that's my job. I need mine. I need mine. So that's the urinal right there, guys. That's the emesis basin for uh, throwing up. Always wear gloves, guys, and know where your supplies are. That's what I would say. My main thing about this slide: know where your supplies are. 
Okay. And portable ultrasound, let me just go through this real quick. Guys, we know when we go on portables, that's us taking our ultrasound machine up to the floor or the units to where the patient is, right? So before you go, especially like if you go to ICU, you always want to clean your machine thoroughly, the whole machine, not just what we do in here, but we just wipe down the translucent clean the console. You want to wipe down your whole machine before and after you go. You don't want to take nothing up because they're going to be quick to blame you guys. That's why you got to basically take a bath before you can go into NICU at LBJ because the, 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 the babies were coming down with a lot of the nosocomial infections, okay? So you really have to be clean when you go to the ICU and they're going to watch you. They're going to watch you wash your hands. They're going to watch you clean your machine in front of them, okay? So get used to that, all right? Um, let me see. Yeah, I'll see. Especially when traveling to ICU or infection control center, transducers should be clean before leaving the department. I mean, all, like I said, that includes all your stuff before leaving the department. Also, when you clean the transducer, guys, if you know that little groove, don't forget, gel gets in there, you know? And then if I'm on portables, I'm not just gonna do one portable and go back downstairs. I may have to do Lauren, I may have to do Ann, I may have to do Adley, all back to back to back. So in, in every in between every every time I have to clean my machine thoroughly. I always look for those beach wipes on the floor, especially at ICU, so I can try to kill as much infection as I can. Okay? Be careful with those black scrubs and the bleach wipes because you'll have that big orange streak because it will discolor your scrub. So be careful with that. All right. But I love those beach wipes when I'm in the ICU. Okay. Uh, take cleaning supplies with you. I never do that because wherever I go, these are usually there. I usually have these at every, wherever I'm at. Okay. Um, some hospitals require that the sonographers access the patient chart to check for written orders. You know, if we're going up to do it, we already have our requests already. You know, but still, get with that nurse before you just go in there and start working because you don't want to have to be interrupted in the middle of your exam and then they say, oh, we're taking this patient to CAT scan. That means you got to stop and come back later. So communicate with the nurse before you start on the portable. Always be aware of infection control warnings and follow protocols. Again, if the patient is contact or, you know, or a droplet infection, or what's the other one? Droplet, contact, and contact airborne, us. and airborne. Mm -hmm. That's why you have to get fitted. You guys all got fitted for your TV mask, right? Yep. That's why you have to get fitted because of the airborne precautions. Those are usually plastered on the wall. But if they're not, make sure you check your chart. I always check my patient information before I go up there anyway, you know? because I want to know everything that's going on. So I don't want to happen to walk into somebody with a droplet infection and, you know, I didn't wear my mask or that person sneezed on me, you know what I mean? So when somebody has that, they should be wearing a mask too, all right? And um, talk with your patient's nurse about your exam and ask about special care instructions. Guys, a lot of times when you're in the ICU, they have these, um, they have these, um, Anti rooms, I think that's what they're called. The anti room, that's what they're called. Yeah. A little anti room is kind of like you got to go in this room and clean up before you can go into the patient room. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times I got to open up the patient room, throw my machine in there, and then come around, go to the anti room, clean up, gown up, mask up, whatever I got to do, because all those supplies for our um, infection control will be in that little anti room. So make that's why I say it's going to be on a little wall, whatever it is, droplet, contact, airborne. It'll be on the wall and you'll know what to do because the sign will tell you exactly contact, you know you gotta get on the gown, right? So with portables, you're not gonna love portables, guys. Nobody loves doing portables, I'm just telling you right now. But still, go up and get that experience because when we're talking about doing our neurosynology or the baby heads, that's the only way you're gonna be able to do them is on portables. No baby's rare that a baby gonna come down to the department and do a baby head. If they do, they're outpatient. These babies are probably fine and moving like crazy. Now, you don't want to do them on them anyway. They're, they're, they're you want to go up there and do it on the, on the baby who's premature, who, who's just kind of laying there for you. They may move their head a little bit, but you don't want to be chasing around the head on the baby, taking 20 minutes to do a baby head when it takes five minutes. Okay? That's all I got for you guys again, guys. Test tomorrow, chapter 9 and 10. I just want chapters 9 and 10.